<laughs> um, Dave Hansen and I are happy to be hosting Charlie O'Kelly, who's here from Friday Harbor. Um, he did his PhD at the University of Washington at Friday Harbor, um, and after uh, a number of stints in places like NSF and teaching in New Zealand and Australia and Canada. I was doing research. Okay. Um, he's back at Friday Harbor. He's interested in biodiversity of protists um, and algae and has been starting to do more work on algal biofuels. Dave met him this summer while visiting Steve Stricker at Friday Harbor. They have a lot of uh, common interests. We uh, are starting a new program in biofuels funded through an SF app score statewide program. And so a lot of discussions in the last couple days on algal biofuels. Charlie was the NSF officer on my PEAT grant funding when I was in grad school. So we have a, a lot of connections um, and linkages. So he's going to talk today about tunnels into history, um, algae that burrow into bore into carbon. Anyway, thanks. They are not boring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Dave. And I'm very, very happy to uh, have an opportunity to uh, try not to bore you with some of the stuff that I do and some of the algae that I work with. Um, and it's my pleasure to give you an opportunity to introduce you to the various flavors of stuff that I do in my research world. I've been at this business for, what, 35 years now? And the world of algae, protozoa, and so forth never ceases to amaze me. As a matter of fact, here's a, just a really quick snapshot of the kinds of stuff that I have been doing over the last several years. I really tell people that the, my place in biology is still to answer the very first question that ever comes to you when you were five years old and tripped over the tree root or something. What is it? You know, so consequently, I do an awful lot of Looking at algae and protozoa and so forth, I grow them. I have a culture collection at the Friday Harbor Laboratories, which I'm trying to make available for various classes of research, teaching, education, all this good stuff. I've um, been involved in a lot of microscopy, a lot of DNA sequence stuff, and increasingly getting involved in the ecology of some of these algae, and especially the things that eat the algae. And that's where I get into the biofuels type of game, which I've been doing the last several years. Because, once again, the question is, what is it? What are we growing? You'd be surprised at the number of people who don't know what it is they're actually growing in their ponds. More to the point, in my case, what eats it? You know, one of the principal elephants in the room for why we do not have algal biofuels in your gas tank right now is the crop disappears because of protozoa long before the crop actually gets to be harvested. So one of the things I'm doing right now in the biofuels realm is to ask what's <coughs> eating the algae, which algae are being eaten, at what rate, and how and hallelujah are we going to be able to figure out how to contain these things once we know what they are. But first, what is it? And so a lot of my biofuels research right now is focused on that particular kind of question. You know, what are the contaminants? What are they eating? How fast? What do we do about it? And even there, I am coming into new questions of biodiversity. For instance, here is a freshwater protozoan that we have not yet formally named, called Retieri ellis, because it throws a net around a prey cell and devours it. It's actually a very efficient eater of hematococcus, which is where you get astaxanthin from, the carotenoid that everybody's fond of right now. And the Roman gladiator that used to catch prey by throwing a net around it was the retiarius, retiarialis, little net gladiator. And our preliminary analyses of where this thing exists in nature is that we don't know. It's not closely related to anything. Are we dealing with a completely new lineage of eukaryotes? I think we finally just managed to send the samples to a lab this week so that we can get genome analysis on this puppy and see just what it is. So there in you know, Twitter version is my career. What is it? What good is it? Right? 
And that brings me to the topic of today. And that is this whole group of algae that actually burrow into limestone, calcium carbonate. Now, how many of you have actually heard of such a thing before? All right, a few of you, okay. Here is a very attractive example. These are two solitary corals that are living in shallow water in a fjord in Chile. And their stalks have calcium carbonate, like all other corals, colonial and solitary. Calcium carbonate is white, correct? Well, you've got a green alga on the left and a pink alga on the right, and they are actually in the carbonate. If you ran your fingernail across, you will not get any color because everything's inside. And so this is perhaps the most attractive picture I could come up with, uh, published in the literature about five years ago, showing you just what a carbonate boring alga is and where it lives. And they're pretty much everywhere. If there is calcium carbonate in the seawater, in fresh water, in a bridge abutment that's been around long enough, you will find these carbonate boring algae. And the habitat has been around forever. There are fossils from the Proterozoic era when carbonates were formed by chemical processes showing cyanobacteria forming boreholes in that calcium carbonate. And of course, since the beginning of um, the Paleozoic and later eras, you have any number of animals, especially in marine, but also in freshwater environments, that produce biogenic calcium carbonate. And of course, limestones and other sorts of things, like concrete, provide additional substrata for these guys to exist. And it turns out that in all of these things, we will find these carbonate boring algae. And even more interesting, and this is where the tunnels into history come to, to, the, to play, when you look at the fossil traces, the boreholes made by these carbonate boring algae from 400 million years ago, you find traces that are dead ringers for things that are alive today. 400 million years ago was a period going to the carbonate sea. You know, very, very alkaline, very, very chalk based ocean, which generated a large radiation of calcifying marine invertebrates. And it looks right at the moment like our current biodiversity of carbonate boring algae, at least in the sea, co radiated with them, and those lineages have survived all the extinctions since then and persist to the present day. So we are looking at what probably could be considered an Ordovician carbonate boring flora. Here's what they look like in life on the left. You take, you know, I used to joke that in order to um, actually see these things, right, um, you have to um, take a piece of coral rock, right, and, and a sledgehammer. Because in order to get a microscope to see through a piece of coral rock, you really need to make a small sliver. So, you know, so I had people in the laboratory with sledgehammers, wham, 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 and they, they, they get pictures like this. The one on the right is the same organism, but is a mold. You take a piece of calcium carbonate with boreholes in it, you pour liquid plastic into it, slowly, and then harden the plastic and dissolve away the calcium carbonate. You end up with a mold of the borehole, which of course mimics the morphology of the original algae. So there's the living one on the left, and the cast on the right, and it's from these casts that we get much of our information on the morphology of these carbonate boring algae. And indeed, this is how we know that ancient Ordovician algae in this habitat look almost exactly like the modern ones. Furthermore, people are taking habitats rich in carbonate boring algae, uh, carbonate like coral reefs, and doing what amount to depth profiles for the different classes of borehole morphologies. And being able to say, all right, this group is in shallow water, this group is in deeper water. And from this information, being able to go to fossils 
and saying, all right, if we see this group of fossils, we are dealing with a tropical reef, shallow water environment. If we see this group, we're dealing with a tropical reef, deep water environment. And consequently, you know, geologists are using this kind of information to help date and characterize in paleo-environmental terms the habitats in which these carbonate boring algae are being found. So it becomes really important from the point of view of somebody doing biodiversity to be able to say, here are, oops, here are a bunch of traces. We give them names, we could say they're species. How many species are here really? Right? Their their by their buying is the gist of my talk for this afternoon. Now, what does this mean to the price of apples? In other words, okay, this is curious. Does it play a role in the environment? Well, it turns out that if you're a parrotfish, you care, big time. Parrotfish, you probably know, are tropical reef fish that actually bite into coral rock. Why would they do something so dumb? You know, it's coral rock, right? Um, it's, okay, it's an organic material, but you know, that's not what we mean by an organic material. Well, the coral rock has lots of life in it. And in this particular case, literally in it, because the primary productivity of that coral rock, 40% of it is, according to many estimates, the actual bores. So the parrotfish knows exactly what it's doing by biting into this rock and getting its nutrients from the things that are in as well as on that rock. So it's a big deal. There's also a commercial deal in that how many of you know about sushi wrapper, right? Seaweeds, right? You know that perhaps the sushi wrapper is a paper made out of a bladed seaweed, which used to be called porphyra. It's now called pyropia, because we, those of us who talk about what is it have just renamed the commercial porphyra, right? Taxonomy strikes again. That alga has a biphasic life history. The blade which is where you get the sushi wrapper from, grows up on the nets, forms spores. The spores germinate to form these little tiny filaments. And they burrow into calcium carbonate and preserve a reservoir for spores that will be eventually be released and give you back the blades. This phase lasts a few weeks. This phase is forever. And farmers will take shells, or oyster shells, with these filaments in them. They know exactly what time of year those filaments will form spores. So they'll have huge arrays of oyster shells in big, large seawater tanks with, you know, over a greenhouse, in a greenhouse. And under cold temperatures and short days, the spores will be released en masse. They drag ropes through the surface of the water, put the ropes in the freezer, and at the appropriate time, put the ropes out on the farm. The blades appear. Six weeks later, you have the raw material for sushi wrapper, for nori. So being able to understand that you have a carbonate boring alga in the life history of this billion dollar industry plant, and knowing how to manage that is critical. It was not even possible until 1947, when a woman by the name of Kathleen Drew Baker first described this life history. The only woman in Japan to have a statue in her honor. We're not done yet with what it matters. Because, remember, we are talking about calcium carbon eight, right? We have calcium carbon as a major player in greenhouse gases, a major player in ocean acidification. It's been estimated that the amount of carbon released into the biosphere by these carbonate boring algae is about one-fifth of the amount that we put out every year by burning fossil fuels. So in a planet that is growing warmer and in an ocean that is growing more acidic, one can predict that the activity of these puppies is getting larger, releasing more carbonate and carbon into the atmosphere and into the biosphere can you say positive feedback loop, right? So if you're reading the IPCC report about having to keep all the fossil fuels in the ground in order to prevent the 
uh, oceans from rising six feet in the next century. What are we going to do about these algae? Right? That's limestone is fossil carbon, just like petroleum is or coal. So maybe I'm overstating the case, but we don't know. Here is a potentially significant source of loading about which we know next to nothing. We don't even know how many species there are and whether those species contribute differentially. For instance, are there different species in the tropics and in temperate zones? All we have are these boreholes, and the boreholes suggest to us that these things are globally distributed. Come back to my principal question. What is it? And developing some indication that maybe even here, we don't know what it is yet. And so that's where I come up with the idea of trying to get at this principal basic what is it question. I wish to know as part of doing this investigation, by the way I'm not by myself, I'll just say me for the now, but I'll tell you about some of the other people later. What is the global biodiversity? A hypothesis is that there is a lot more species diversity than we know about, and that there are a lot of cryptic species hidden with any particular morphology. And in terms of their performance in the environment, are all carbonate boring algae created equal? And hypotheses include that species do differ from each other in environmental tolerances, cold water, hot water, you know, um, that species distributions of that reflect this kind of differentiation in physiology. In other words, no species is globally distributed, even though the fossil people say who they are. And that you can sometimes make at least a little bit of correlation to morphology, to species, and to environment once you actually learn how to figure out which morphologies actually matter. So that's what we're up to. And this is how we do it. You take a sample. This is a mollusk shell from the vicinity of the San Juan Islands. You see it's pink. All that pink are carbonate boring algae in the shell. There's probably at least three species in there. So we take specimens, take a chip. You know, I literally go in with a razor blade, and the chips are like, you know, one millimeter. You know, tiny. You don't want much, because there's an awful lot of other stuff there, too. You don't want them. Take the, and put those into spot plate wells, we have seawater, put them in the incubator, wait three months. They don't grow very fast. And you collect these cells that actually come out of these chips. Then, and this is essential, you take the isolated algae and you give them back to calcium carbonate and see if they bore in. Because, believe me, there's an awful lot of pretenders out there. You might get 15 species of algae out of one of these chips. Only one of them is your target. The rest of them won't bore into calcium carbonate. So you go, no, bye. You only keep the ones that will do the boreholes. Then you can get at the microscopy of live and cast casts and start getting DNA sequences. And with all of this, you can start asking some of those key questions, testing those hypotheses I put forward for you. Two case studies will illustrate where we're going with this. One of these is perhaps one of the most commonly reported cyanobacteria amongst the carbonate boring algae. It's originally described as the species Plectonema terebrans. That was done by a couple of French fellows, Bourdain and Flahot, in 1889. They were the first to actually catalog carbonate boring algae for both freshwater and marine habitats. So these two guys were the starting point. They published a 60-page paper, basically documenting all of their discoveries along these lines over a five-year period. So cyanobacteria, these are the pink ones in my solitary corals. And they are basically uh, filamentous, non heterocystous cyanobacteria that exhibit something called false branching. We basically know very, very little more about them. In the cast, they look like this. And for those of you who aren't familiar with fossil terminology, a cast does not have the same name as a biological species. It's got its very own nomenclature, so that when you see a cast, 
like this, you will use this name, Scolesia filosa. So this is the name of the caste, and this is the name of the biological species. Our question, one of the many, is this one species or many? We don't know. We'll find, this is what we're trying to find out. So can we grow them? If so, will they grow into carbonate? And how many of a strain, how many species do we get out of the ones that pass those first two tests? One species in the literature, you one biological species, one ichno species, that's the name for that fossil borehole, an ichno species. But there was a paper published a year and a half ago which they looked at algae from field collected samples, did DNA samples, and they didn't get one species. They got six. Six different entities in one, two, well actually, yeah, one group, an isolator, another group. All of these fit the plectinema or the uh, Scolesia filosa morphotype. Lots of different biological species, but we don't have the organisms. So we don't really know if any of these are truly boring into the carbonate or just sitting on the surface. What we do know, there's a lot more than meets the eye. So here are samples from the collections that we made. Two different morphotypes, one with very short cells, one with very long cells from temperate waters around San Juan Island in the Washington State and from Massachusetts. We got 11 of these strains, two like this, nine like that. Lo and behold, the two with the short cells were not burrowing into calcium carbonate. The nine with the longer cells were. So already we know two species, but we reject one because it is not a borer. We do the DNA, the 16S uh, ribosomal RNA genes, and all the bores cluster together. They are not identical, as in they are not 100% synonymous, but according to the rules of bacteriological nomenclature, they are close enough to be considered one species. And there's one environmental sequence from the Australian Great Barrier Reef that falls in this same cluster. Here are the two species that do not bore into carbonate. They are different from each other and different from the carbonate boring group. So that small difference in morphology turns out to be a significant difference in the DNA sequence data. We have at least two species, possibly three, and only one of them is a carbonate bore. So the carbonate boring strains form a clade non-carbonate boring strains do not belong to it. And both of those clades, not shown on this graph, but it's, I alluded to it here, they're unrelated to the clades that were found in those intertidal carbonates by the colleague in 2012. So now instead of there being like six groups, we have seven. And this one we confirm is carbonate boring. We don't know about the other six yet because we don't have samples. Now, this taxon had been known as Plectinema. It also sometimes got known by the genus name Leptolingbia. Well, there's Plectinema and Leptolingbia down here. Totally unrelated to these things up here. And if I extended the tree down through the floor and into the next story, you would find <coughs> species of Plectinema and Leptolingbia distributed all through this tree. These genera are polyphyletic, and none, either of them, includes the carbon, just demonstrated carbonate boring cyanobacteria that we found in Washington and Massachusetts. Can we grow them? Yes. Will they burrow into carbonate? Well, we found a group that did. We've got one species, but that's one species different from all the other ones that have been found so far. And because it is from temperate zone waters, which is uh, very close to the waters around uh, Le Croisic in France, which is the type locality for this. This might be the bona fide 
Plectonema terebrans, for which we'll need a new genus. So, we still have an awful lot of unanswered questions about the things that follow the same morphology but live in intertidal um, tropical habitats, subtidal tropical habitats. They may be the same, they may be different. At least now, we have a reference point. That's case study one. Case study two is perhaps the second most abundant uh, representative of the carbonate boring flora in tropical and temperate marine waters. And unlike the first one, which is a pink cyanobacterium, this one is a green green. It's a member of the chlorophytes. And it's referred to by the name of Ostriobium kecketii. Keket was a collector of seaweeds in the 19th century, and Ostriobium, Ostriobium comes from Austria, which is one of the genera of edible oysters. Obviously, the thing was first found in oyster shells. It's a very unusual organism. This is the one that has um, dates back at least to the Ordovician. It's one of the oldest fossil taxa we have. If you know about green algal morphology, and I say the word siphonous, it might mean something to you. This alga does not have cross walls. All of this network is a single un unpeated tube. Like things like Codium and Halamida, Eudotia, and some of those others, Calerpa, some of the largest tropical green seaweeds. Ostriobium has that same morphology. It just does it in a microalga instead of a proper macrophyte seaweed. Once again, it is considered to be universally distributed. There is its single um, Ichno species, the fossil name, and here is the single uh, biological species name that has been assigned to all of these things. You find them in the um, sub-Antarctic and Arctic waters, you find them in the tropics and everywhere in between. And they are famous for their association with living corals. Here is the cast of one of these, just to give you an idea of what it will look like. Same questions, by and large, as one we asked with plectinema. Will they burrow into calcium carbonate? It was, in fact, a German group that demonstrated this for a species in the North Sea. <clears throat> and how many species among the things that we can demonstrate will burrow into <coughs> calcium carbonate? I showed you that the literature says one. But three years ago, there was a study published by a group that went to one location in the Gulf of Eilat, collected a series of corals from that one location, came back, did DNA surveys from it, and found at least seven very distinct taxon groups that they assigned to Ospreobi. So there is evidence from that perspective now, Ostreobium is not a single species, but even in one single location is a bunch of species. These are environmental sequences, so we really do not yet know how to interpret some of the branch links in some of these clusters, whether those are actual uh, different sequences or whether that represents some insecurity in the actual sequences that were generated. The authors did not choose to present us with the actual sequence data, so we don't know. So we don't know whether Group A actually contains one species or four. So there's an awful lot of, there's something going on here, but no cultures. We don't know to which organism these sequences belong. And a further question, this was a tropical site. Ostreobiums are found in temperate zones. The type specimen is from a temperate ocean. Are the temperate species the same as the tropical ones? Or are they different? So what we did, we went back and got some more rocks, and we got some more slivers, and waited three months for things to grow up, and collected 28 strains, most of them from Washington area. We did get one from Massachusetts. We had a couple others. They died. Oh, well. So all of them were in a carbonate, which was very fortunate. So we were very con confident that we had you know, representatives of Ostreobium. And here is one from the Salish Sea and one from the Salish Sea. Do they look the same or different? How different? 
<laughs> yeah, that's how that's that's what we thought. This one actually has what I call cables. So there are some um, main axes that actually have a little bit of differentiation, um, as opposed to here, where the main axes are very much the same diameter as the laterals. About the only difference that we found among all of these 28 strains. Some of them have cables, some of them don't. Everything else, they look exactly alike. One species, one morphological species. That's what the DNA tells us. There are at least eight. And I put on the tree a series of taxa in the uh, Calorpales, or Bryocidales. The distances in uh, many of these taxon groups among these temperate osteoliums are at least as great as those that separate genera in the rest of the Bryopsidales. It makes sense, after all, these things have fossil records dating back at least to the Ordovician. It suggests to me that there has been a considerable amount of cryptic evolution leading to several different species that have formed within this one morphological type. And this happens to be a tree based on ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase sequences. Those based on tough A are exactly concrete. And the bootstraps are pretty good. Add to this tree the sequences found in the Gulf of Eilat, and there is exactly zero congruence. The tropical entities and the temperate entities are clearly distinct. This tree is based on short sequences because the published sequences are very short, and that's why I didn't put very many bootstrap values on here because the sequences are too short for a robust tree generation. However, no matter how you do the analysis, these same groups appear. The order might shuffle, but the same groups are retained. And we had a further cross-check on that because we did get samples from Hawaii, and we have samples with full-length sequences from the Philippines, published by a colleague. The same relationship obtains. No group of algae that we isolated from temperate zone waters correlates with any representative of Osteobium that we've gotten from tropical waters. As it turns out, the tropical things that we've gotten from Hawaii don't match the things that um, Gutner, Hawk, and Fine found in the Gulf of Eilat. So it looks like we haven't even come close to saturating the biodiversity curve. I wouldn't expect to with data from four sites, but it, remember, we are dealing with pe things that people have said represent one species. And we've also come up with things like this, which are carbonate boring members of this Bryopsidalian lineage that are not Osteobium, they belong to some other group. We don't have any clue yet what those are. So, answering our questions, yep, Osteobium will indeed burrow into calcium carbonate, the ones that we've got, and instead of having one species, in one in the genus, we have at least 11. And at least three more things that are somewhere else in the Bryopsidales. A huge amount of cryptic biodiversity in this series of algae. And it looks to me as if we have very distinct floras. There are is a temperate flora of Osteobium and a tropical flora of Osteobium. If you are a taxonomist, you're saying, which one of these is Osteobium gecadii? Well, at the moment, until we go to France and go to the Croisique, collect oyster shells, culture from there, and determine which of any of the algae there matches sequences from uh, where we've got, we won't know what Osteobium gecadii is. In the meantime, we have all these other taxa that if we were going to name them, I'm not really nervous about that yet, but if we were going to name them, they'd all need different names. And the fossil people are still screaming at me because they basically say, well, all of these are Ichnoreticulina elegans. How are we going to make any distinguishing 
marks about them. They say, I don't know. Maybe there are, if you look carefully at the fossils, you might see some that have cables and some that don't, and that might give you some indication. I've been trying to do morphometrics on these things, and I have not come up with any kind of statistically significant discrimination amongst all the casts we've got. So, we have a problem. So those are my two case studies. As it turns out, there are several different groups of these carbonate boring algae, which I've not yet touched on, have touched on plectinema, have touched on osteobium. We're beginning to get a bit of a picture. And my colleagues are adding a lot more tropical samples to this, so that we hope in another few months, years, hopefully not years, we will have uh, a global phylogeny for things placed in this osteobium. We also have another group of cyanobacteria, which are uh, heterocyst-forming forms called mastigacolias, which are actually very, very fast-growing, uh, relatively fast-growing cyanobacteria that form. And once again, here is a case in which we have a single species, but I, we have evidence already that there are probably three or four of them. And the thing that has been described as being the epitype for this probably will not match the actual type, which is from cold water in Sweden. We're still trying to get samples from Sweden so that we can test that hypothesis. And then another very abundant green, something called Pheophila dendroides. We have a lot of data on that. That's again a thing that's very, very worldwide distributed. And in that case, we know that there are at least five different species, all encompassed within this morphology. And then uh, two groups we haven't talked about, mainly because the studies are still very much in their infancy. One is the whole porphyra complex. There are probably hundreds of species in the Bangiales, porphyra, Bangia, pyropia, Vildemania. Um, I can't list them all. I don't, my memory won't hold them all. Um, each of them has an alternate stage. And, and that is a carbonate boring alternate stage. And that's going to require a massive grant. Maybe we get the Japanese farmers to fund a grant to try and work out what the different carbonate boring stages of all these look like in the field. We are, in fact, trying to work on this now for uh, pyropia in Hawaii, where people are interested in warm water pyropias that can be turned into sushi wrapper. And we have a study in the progress which tells us that instead of there being one species of pyropia in Hawaii, there are five, and maybe more. Lots more cryptic diversity. <clears throat> and then a whole group of cyanobacteria that sort of are classified as uh, pseudofilamentous. These are the ones that predominate in intertidal zones in uh, terrestrial concretes and things like that. Probably hundreds of species there too. And sorting that out might take longer than I've got on this planet. But there they are. This, this is the, basically the biodiversity <laughs> checklist for the, the carbonate boring algae in marine environments and pretty much takes care of the freshwater and terrestrial ones too, especially these high Lentia types of things. So lots of work yet to be done. But I think that the bottom line remains the bottom line, and that is we still, you know, we're asking the first question, what is it? We don't know. We're finding out that many of these things have um, many cryptic species encased within a particular morphology. We may never get to the point of being able to tell the um, paleobiological community how to divide up all the cryptic species from the morphotypes they're seeing in fossil strata. Uh, and that will complicate matters of trying to reconstruct paleo environments using these boar fossils. And that's my story. I do obviously have a whole lot of people that have been involved with this. I'm especially thankful for undergraduates like Geneva, Jeff, Angela, and Lauren, all of whom 
have contributed either DNA work or cast work to this stuff. Um, people, that's one of the great benefits of working at the Friday Harbor Labs. You get a lot of people coming through, they have a short period of time, they get enthused about this kind of stuff. Uh, we have the scanning electron microscope there, we have all of the DNA stuff, and they come in, they work for a few months. Um, Geneva, I actually had for 18 months, and we're able to do a whole bunch of solid research contributing to this particular study. Uh, colleagues from Hawaii and from France, uh, Aline was in both Hawaii and France, and they scored some money from the French government to help get samples and process some of the DNA sequences and so forth and so on. And the Washington State Department of Natural Resources funded the boat trips from which we got samples from the Salish Sea. And then a whole list of other people who have helped along, along the way. You know this, everybody, every project has like one name on it, actually should have about 40. But it's the same with me and with everyone else. And a lot of this, we remember a scientist from the University of Hawaii at Manoa who was interested in the uh, biogeochemistry of these boring algae, who was the supervisor for Aline Tripolet, um, who was very, very helpful with us, visited the lab, started to work on the physiological issues, and then tragically died of a heart attack at the beginning of the year. So we, in memoriam. Okay, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Yes? I thought on the rates of growth and the rates of carbonate dissolution from the culture studies. Um, that was what we were going to start doing with Marlin before he passed away. Um, I can tell you that these things generally grow quite slowly. Um, but uh, as far as rates are concerned, we weren't interested in that at the, because of the, way, the nature of the study. We were asking yes-no questions. But by and large, I can tell you that if you take a um, piece of clamshell the size of your thumbnail and put some algae that will bore into it, into that dish, the clamshell will become fully covered in like four months. So they do not grow at all rapidly. And the, the whole question of rates, some of them do grow more fast, faster than others, and then carbonate dissolution rates will be proportional to that. So the capacity, maybe I missed this, the capacity to dissolve the uh, carbonate, is that based on an enzyme recovered by the algae, or is it maybe mediated by endosymbionts or other like I guess association with microbial communities inside the algae. I'm just wondering if like your your protocol, right? You just put the chip into the well and then you wait for months and months until you do your test, your functional test. Are these particular, you know, isolates able to dissolve the carbonate? Is it possible that it is due to some other symbiosis with other microorganisms, you lose that capacity because the endosymbionts have left the algae or am I just <laughs> we don't know. There is exactly one paper on the subject uh, published by the fellow in, a, in a, uh, uh, Garcia. Can't even come up with his name anymore. Uh, Ferran Garcia Pichel, who was at Arizona State. Yeah. Um, and he has determined that the bur burrowing function in Masticocoleus testarum is based on a calcium-dependent ATPase. Yeah. So, and that calcium-dependent ATPase requires uh, photosynthesis to function mm -hmm. because it doesn't work in the dark. Okay. And that is literally as far as we've gotten. However, the Mastigocoleus was in azenic culture, so there were no other bacteria around. So that at least in that one experimental system, it was the cyanobacterium and no partners that were dealing with it. And, I'm pretty convinced that that will be the explanation, um, but we have a long, long way to go before we have a full understanding of how the boring mechanism occurs. So there's no like phylogenetic studies on that particular ATPase to compare ATPase in a different... Unless Farron has it and hasn't published it yet. 
Um, yeah, well, well, then, there you go. Well, uh, this is the kind of thing that we could be doing with the genomic stuff. Yeah. Um, I am presuming that hydrogen pumps are involved somehow, because I would have to. It's always tip growth for these things, and also some lateral growth as boreholes expand, mm -hmm. but mostly it's tip growth. And so if I were doing membrane physiology on this sort of thing, I might expect to be have a concentration of, of hydrogen pumps at the domains where the boreholes are being formed. Mm -hmm. um, but that's sort of like you know, pie in the sky hypothesis at this point. Okay. And I think we're a long way away from getting to the point where we can test the genomic approaches. Maybe we get closer faster. Mm -hmm. but, Any chance that dicarboxylic acids are playing a role in the uh, entirely possible. Um, I don't know enough to be able to. Some fungi do that. That's um, good question, and I don't. <laughs> yeah, I simply don't know the answer. Um, it's possible. Uh, there is enough phylogenetic distance between these things and the fungi to suggest that there may be something completely different. Uh, in um, some of Ferrin's inhibitor studies, where he talked about the inhibit inhibiting. Uh, the calcium dependent ATPases in some of the algae he tested, other than Mastica coleus, you got function in some cases and not function in others. So that's a preliminary indication that there may be multiple mechanisms involved. But I quite literally don't know anymore. Is there a metabolic benefit to dissolving the, the calcium carbonate, or is it just sort of as, as a foothold in the home? I favor the latter hypothesis, but again, I'm, uh, data are pretty lacking. Um, my explanation, which is a just so story for the ecologists out here, is that the carbonate serves as a hiding place. As a matter of if you are a small alga that's growing very slowly in a world full of gastropods, you're lunch. But if you are embedded in a calcium carbonate, not only are you not lunch, but the snails are cleaning your windows for you. You get crazy. Right back, of yeah, because you've got things that, if, if, oftentimes, you will get that. You will get a grasshopper with a strong enough radula to rasp off the top half millimeter. But the layers are frequently one to two millimeters deep. And so they just simply, you know, get some filaments growing further down into the carbonate and others spreading out. So they take advantage of any new surface that they can find. So I think that the explanation for that is almost entirely ecological. And any benefit of carbon from the dissolution um, may be, well, gravy. But test it, see. So if they're boring from the tip and they need photosynthesis to bore, how do they deal with attenuation of light? Because they mostly grow laterally. Very rarely will they grow down. Okay. Uh, and I would assume that there is a certain level below which they can't reach before attenuation does become uh, fatal. So. Um, the, what happens, obviously, is that as you bore away the calcium carbonate, it is eroded away, and so that you, if you break one of these things open, you'll find that if the shell is that thick, the algae are here. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty constant relationship for any particular environment. So, so that thing, that's, that's how they deal with attenuation. They don't. Mm -hmm. they, they avoid it whenever possible. So how do you deal with um, depth of sampling for your, your, you know, assessing biodiversity at these different locations? Because it seems really possible that with your limited samples, I mean, and the amount of time and resources it takes for you to test these different questions, you could be missing out on a lot of the diversity that is actually at those locations. So then to try and, you know, m make global uh, yeah, As, uh, global conclusions about diversity mm -hmm. in these groups is kind of hard. You are correct. And in fact, I would argue that the methods that we've used here are inadequate and will always be inadequate for a global biodiversity study. I reckon that this kind of study is doing two things. One, it's giving us a starting point. Uh, and the other is that it's giving us raw materials that we can do other experiments on such as uh, investigating the role of carbon, such as investigating attenuation, such as investigating um, what actually is the mechanism for boring. Without them, we don't have any tools for that. Um, but 
one way I can envision proceeding is being use some of the data we've got from these cultured studies as sort of like reference points for like uh, global uh, biodiversity genomic work. And so you make a lot of samples and you can then probe for the total an inventory of osteobiums or hyellas or whatever. If you don't have that starting point, I argue, then you'll get a lot of these sequences, but you don't really have any clue who belongs to what. Um, and especially with the cyanobacteria, where we saw that the trees are really quite, um, you know, the trees are really all over the place. Then you've got, um, you have a very, very hard time interpreting your data. With some of these culture-based studies, you have some reference points and then your genomic studies will be a little bit more informed. But I do think that it's that way that we'll get the diversity, not this way. So do you, have a, do you know if it's, is this um, the, the boring morphologies uh, the primary or, or, or one of a very few methods of assessing sort of past sea depths or origin depths? I mean, is this, is this, losing these, this data, do we really just have no idea of the depths of the oceans, the shallow seas, and the no, there are certainly time. several other techniques. This happens to be a convenient one yeah, yeah. for the people who do this kind of stuff. But um, I would argue that people have other ways of going about this, uh, but and they will find them if yeah. they're not already using them in terms of like uh, uh, isotope dating things right. and, and isotope characterizations and things like that. Um, this just happens to be handy, and people have argued that yes, it is a possibility. Uh, I'm arguing that we don't lose all the data, but we just have to be, as usual, very careful about overinterpretation. So, and I also have to be honest with you: this is not a really heavy-duty component of paleoecological assessment. It's a kind of a tiny backwater, and I'm not giving anybody any evidence to make it anything more than a tiny backwater. <laughs> Yes. Charlie, you mentioned uh, all these species in molluscan shells. Mm -hmm. uh, what about anything outside of mollusks uh, that might bore into just rocks? I know there's bangias that attach to rocks. Mm -hmm. Are they boring into the surface of these rocks, or is there something special about the calcium carbonate of these molluscan shells? Or? Well, I hope I didn't give you the impression that there was something special about uh, molluscan shells. They just happen to be available. As far as these boring algae are concerned, if it's calcium carbonate, it's, so it's a subject for boring. Calcium, you know, for an experimental point of view, the mollusk shells, especially in areas where you don't have coral, uh, are a convenient uh, substrate. Nobody's going to be counting how many mollusk shells, unlike coral animals, right? You sample a coral animal in Hawaii, you've got 14 bureaucrats trying to record every piece you've taken. Mollusk shells, I don't care so much. So they, they, and since calcium carbonate is calcium carbonate, you can go ahead and make use of that substrate. Um, the one that really gets to uh, me is literally coral reef or other kind of limestone rock, um, ancient stuff, which will also have these things in them. So if it's carbonate, it'll get bored into. So don't please take away that mollusk shells or anything special. They're just convenient. Yes. By the way, I think you have another seminar coming up in a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How long, functionally, how long do these take to establish in terms of boring patterns? Because functionally, could theoretically, if you have a higher concentration of these algae, I understand they're very slow growing, but could you possibly reestablish some coral reefs with enough algae to, I, I'm just trying to think of, of functional ways to apply this information. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the big deals is that we're talking about degradation rather than assembly. So um, certainly when you have a large mass of these algae, some of these, uh, especially the Pheophila, they are the first recruits to any new carbonate surface that comes available. Um, so if you have a lot of those algae around and a lot of bare rock, then you will get considerable amounts of these dissolutions. And we don't have a really good idea of the succession patterns. Um, 
what we do know is that there's a lot of diversity in shallow water, less diversity in deeper water. Um, my point about the um, ocean acidification and global warming thing is that since there are a lot of these things out there, remember 40% of the primary productivity of coral reef rock. If you add temperature, if you lower pH, you're probably going to degrade um, these rocks faster than they already are being degraded. And we need better measurements. And I would argue that the, knowing what species you're dealing with and having a better idea eventually of which species are doing most degradation fastest um, will help add that piece of information to the global carbon budget picture. So I guess you can get these from different protective water, you know, temperature, pH. Is that the way you culture them? Are you allowed, is it, do you maintain those natural conditions? Or are you giving them something that they all like? What? Yeah, I'm giving them something that they all like because I didn't have the resources to try and do several different kinds of conditions. So the only thing I... Is that they're very tolerant? Sorry? Does that mean that they're very tolerant to any so, kind well, of condition? Well, I, I didn't make the point very strongly, but in general, if I isolate it from temperate waters, um, it will tend not to grow at tropical temperatures. If I isolate it from tropical waters, it will tend not to grow at temperate you know, temperatures. So at 23 degrees, something isolated in the tropics won't grow at 15. Something isolated from the temperate zone won't grow at 23. So we have a preliminary indication that these sorts of things do matter. Yeah, we didn't get there. That was what Marlon and Nui were going to do before he passed away. So, um, so yeah, but it's, all those are open. Lots, lots to do. Any more questions? Well, let's give Charlie another round of applause. Thanks, thank you.